Putting freight trains together might not be as easy as you think. Let me show you why. Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. Now you may have heard me mention in the past that I'm a member of the West Campbell Model Railway Society. In fact, I'm a very poor example of a secretary. Um, but I'll soon relinquish that and go back to the exhibitions manager because we like to have an exhibition at Christmas time and just an ordinary open day uh, in June. So my challenges return. It's worth saying that during the Covid situation, let's say, we lost a fair few members. I'm not saying they died, that didn't happen, um, but some of the older members didn't really want to come back, they felt insecure. And when we did reopen and the guys came back, one particular layout, which is the one I'm involved with, a OODCC layout called Mallingford, we were just using it as a glorified, um, what would you say, landscaped test track really. It's got four continuous loops on it. We just bunged our trains on, turned them on, watched them go whizzing round and had a nice chat and a cup of tea and a cake and a bun and that sort of thing. And it was more of a man time catch up really than modelling. <clears throat> well since then we've now sort of regained our modelling mojo. And when I went to the club on Saturday we decided what you know what who would do what task and so on and so forth and we we divvied out the uh, the jobs to the individuals um, but it was, it was easy to notice that there were some trains going around the layout that were somewhat unusual let's say so, and if people wanted to run their um, EWS excuse me <coughs> run their EWS ballast train being pulled by some coronation or princess or whatever then Fill your boots, why shouldn't you? At the end of the day, it's rule one. It's your trains, you run what you like and, and don't, uh, don't get too upset by other people. But one of our chaps did bring along a couple of um, steam-driven goods trains and as you can see here, he's had a gentleman to fit front lamps to them, which sort of perked up my interest into the meanings of lamps and leading on from there the construction of freight, freight trains because back in the day let's say where you didn't have block trains of identical wagons you know that are 50 wagons long and nothing wrong with that if you model that sort of stuff and you want 50 identical tankers in various stages of weathering behind your class 56 or whatever so be it but if you've got um, a 9f let's say with a mixed freight it brings a certain extra thing to a layout or Perhaps I, perhaps we might perceive that. And again, with the early diesels, again with mixed freight trains and that sort of stuff. So looking at his freight trains, I came to the conclusion that, well, are the wagons all in the wrong order or does it really matter? Now, <laughs> some people might turn around and say, Charlie, you need to get a life. This is getting too sad, you're starting to count rivets. But perhaps we should consider what order we put our wagons into our trains to maintain a not prototypical a realistic um, view to how the train might be constructed so let's have a little look into that today now with the fiddle yard starting to take shape at long last i've popped up the attic the other day and brought down some of my rolling stock and this was to test out the trains running up and down the helix because you always get uncoupling issues caused by um, poor couplings really at the end of the day I mean tension lock couplings were never good and also to test the track to see if we have any derailments and my wife said gosh you've got a lot of trains but I don't really think that she meant it as a compliment now this little beast is a 9F and it's pulling 10 grey 16 tonne Mineral wagons. Nothing remarkable about that, I hear you say. And there isn't really. She's a very capable locomotive. What is, of course, worth mentioning is that all of these 16 tonne mineral wagons, being grey, are known as unfitted. That is, there is no braking system in them whatsoever. And if the first one isn't brake fitted, neither is the last because nothing would run through these. Uh, wagons. At the back end there we see a towed guards van and the towed guards van also is not fitted with brakes otherwise it would be bulk sight in colour. 
because bauxite means it has a braking system, whereas if it's grey, it doesn't. And that goes almost without exception throughout the rolling stock fleet. And similarly, here is a 16 ton mineral wagon, but because it's bauxite in colour, it would be brake fitted. And if the whole train was fitted with these, and it was fitted with, let's say, a fitted guards van, then the whole train would have brakes that operate independently from the locomotive, so they would all apply their brakes at the same time. Fundamental, really, with railway safety. However, if you had put, if you had a, a train full of bauxite ones and one grey one in the front, then the system would be broken, then nothing would be braked. So having a bauxite coloured wagon means you have brakes and you transmit the braking ability back down the train. And similarly, 20 ton guards vans, not fitted with brakes, fitted with brakes. Either would go on the back of this train because it's an unfitted train. But if all these were bauxite in colour, you don't need this beast you need this one because this one has the braking ability triggered by the locomotive's vacuum brake system. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. And two other points well worth pointing out is we now need some configuration of headlamp on this locomotive and if it's a class J which would be a through working mineral wagon then you would need a lamp here on as we look at it on the left hand side and also you need the correct lighting in the guards van at the rear. Now looking at this guards van you can see that it has three rear facing red lights which means it's fitted to an unfitted train. If it was a fitted train the two outside lamps wouldn't be required, just the one single red. But as it's unfitted, this is what's needed. If I turn this around the other way, there are two forward facing, as in towards the locomotive, white lights. Hopefully you can see them, one of them just here. And the reason for that one, or for those two lamps is, from the train itself from the locomotive the driver or fireman can look back down the train and at night if you've had a breakaway obviously you won't be able to see the white lights but if you can see them you know that your train is intact because should you get a breakaway there's no way of the guard telling the driver what's going on. Of course during the day you can see that there's a guards van there so you don't have the same issues. If, of course, it was a fitted train and you had a breakaway, then all the brakes would come on. Clever stuff. Now, if you wonder where discs fit into this scenario, well, the discs on the early diesels were fitted in exactly the same positions as the lamps, because the four character head code had yet to come into service. So this peak here should be pulling a Class A Express passenger service. And here we have another couple of examples of trains running under the H classification. This one's unfitted 16 tonne mineral wagons and then a beautiful 9F pulling uh, a rake of Nick's freight. And finally we've got another 9F which is pulling 16-tonne uh, mineral wagons which are fully fitted and therefore she is a Class C, an express freight. And bringing us a little more up to date, here we have a peak running under a Class K and also a Class 20 running under Class F. I find it reassuring that our preserved loco fleet are still using these headlamp codes and here are a couple of Class A trains that ran through Castle Carey. First we have Tornado and then Bittern. Back from the edge of Platform 1, the next train is not scheduled to stop.
please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if you hit the little bell icon and go for all then you get a notification every time I release a new video. So that's our 9F sorted. So now let's go and put this one away and bring up something a little more complicated. So the next thing we're going to take a look at is a fuel train. Nothing remarkable about this, I hear you say. Oh, no, there isn't really. What have we got? Well, we've got a 33 with, I don't know, eight tankers on it. But what's the right configuration? Well, we're now in the realms of brake fitted rolling stock and all these BP Shell TTAs are fitted with vacuum brakes. No big shakes there really, is there? And on the back end, we've got a beautiful Queen Mary guards van, which we'll come back to in a minute. But what I hear you say is that van doing behind the locomotive, well, as well as the steam days, in the early diesel days, you had to fit a barrier vehicle between the locomotive and the hazardous goods, i.e. the petrol in the tankers behind. They believed clearly that should you have a fire in the locomotive, it would spread quickly to the, uh, to the rest of the train and you would end up with a catastrophe. And in the days of steam, I'm sure this happened, but in these early days of diesels, then barrier vehicles were always used. Now, of course, this barrier vehicle has to be bauxite because bauxite will mean that it has brakes and therefore the brakes from the locomotive will now transmit right the way through because the whole train is now a fitted train along with the Queen Mary guards van, which is also fitted. And what do we need on the back of the train? Well, I did mention that there was a Queen Mary and she will carry just the one red rear facing lamp because you don't need the other two reds because if you get a breakaway, then the whole train will apply its brakes. The Queen Mary is quite an interesting guards van really. It doesn't have just the two axles, it has twin bogies and it's called a Queen Mary because apparently the ride for the guard was extremely comfortable. It's not a 20 ton guards van, this time it's a 25, mainly used on the southern region. One other thing that's worth a mention at this stage is the head code because the southern region didn't conform to the normal four character head codes. And as you can see here, this head code is 89. It really has no bearing on what the train is pulling. It just refers geographically to where it's going to and the area it's operating within. So let's move on our older train and bring in its replacement. And as you can see this time, there is no barrier wagon and also the guards van has disappeared. Why is this? Well, because times have moved on and so has the network's trust in its locomotives and braking systems. And here with this class 47, we have once more a set of TTAs, this time mobiles, because companies don't mix their, uh, their, their brands, as it were, with trains. They tend to be in fixed rakes. And taking a look at the head code of this train, we can see that we're running with a 6V head code, 6 being a fully fitted block train and V being that it's uh, 
inter-regional either to or from the West Country. 53 is just a numerical uh, number of how many movements of that day and 50 it starts sort of at number one and as the day progresses it sort of climbs up so this might be a kind of midday train sort of type number. As I said we look back down the train and there is no guards van and there is no barrier wagon. However the guard still existed he's just in the rear cab monitoring the train. So let's move off the class 47 and bring in something perhaps a little more dynamic. Now here we have a real favourite which is the mixed freight train. A real lovely little beast. So clearly the clue's in the name, it's a mixed freight. And as we can see here, she's carrying various goods, whether she be vans, cement, and all sorts of other commodities. But how should the train be rigged? Well, as I've said in the past, this is obviously a mix between braked and unbraked goods. And as usual, sat at the back end there is a 21 ton guards van. But shouldn't we put all the braked components at the front? Well, clearly we should. So we start about by removing the ones that aren't braked so it can come out, the cement wagons can come up. As we move back down the train, we see a few more unbraked ones. So these need to go, that needs to go, and so on until we've re rebuilt the train with the unbraked stock at the rear. Well, our configuration is now complete, and as you can see, the bulk site painted wagons, meaning they are vacuum fitted, are towards the front of the train, whereas as you get towards the rear, at this point here, we hit the unfitted, and all the remaining stock are unfitted, so therefore if we get a breakaway, then the brakes will not come on, unless, of course, the breakaway happens within this area, because these brakes would naturally be applied, but not on the ones at the back of the train. There is also a further complication with this train, inasmuch as there are four gunpowder wagons. Now I'm pretty sure, similarly to fuel wagons, to put these behind the locomotive, you need to utilise a barrier wagon. However, what I don't know is whether we put these four wagons together within this train, whether you would need a barrier wagon between these wagons themselves, because let's say one of these caught fire and exploded, then, then clearly you would get a sympathetic detonation that runs through the other wagons. There's something called the Explosive Storage and Transport Committee who, laid, who lays down these regulations, but I'm actually unsure of what was going on back in the day. And these are actually GWR wagons, or so they're still labelled, um, but I'm sure the regulations wouldn't have changed. On the back end is the usual fitted guards van, but of course the fittings don't work because there are unfitted stock in front of it. Therefore, as usual, she must display the rear, the three rear red lights. Now having reconfigured the train itself, there's a complication with the head code 
as in the 8V. It may no longer be an 8 because if it's around about sort of 1968-ish, it would actually be maybe a class 5 which is an express freight train with automatic brake operative on not fewer than half of the vehicles and ours has it on 10 of the 19. So then it could be a class 5 or in a more up-to-date book it could be a class 7 express freight partially fitted. God, life's a worry. Now perhaps no reasonably sized layout should be without a ballast train. And this one here is generally made up of Helgen dogfish. Now I've left the sound off on the loco because there's something about these wagons. Because they've got brass wheels, they seem to attract all the dirt they can possibly find. And they really do have a massive carbon build-up. Along with that, I think it's fair to say the couplings are absolutely dreadful. And there is no doubt in my mind that if I were to shunt these wagons in a moment or two back across these points, they would derail. So, just to prove the point, Ah, what a surprise. And it's because the tension lock couplings droop that the lower arm of the hook mechanism actually both strike the rails. This is absolutely appalling engineering. It really is terrible stuff. Now hopefully here you can see what I mean. If I just run these wagons forward by hand, you can see the hook is very low. Well, it comes across the point and then it snags on the point. And the thing is, it's not just that one either because it happens quite regularly. That one there just brushed against it. Oh, that one sparked and caused a short. They really are appalling. As far as the wagons are concerned themselves, they're actually quite decent. Until you start to look at the wheels. Because they're made of brass, I shall show you shortly. how poor they really are. And then with a close-up on the wheels you can actually see 
the lumps of carbon that are formed. And it's not down to poor maintenance by the previous owner, but it's just the way these brass wheels seem to build up the carbon for a pastime. So here's a wagon that I've cleaned the wheels and I use 2000 grit emery cloth and after a while um, they come clean but as you can see it's not all off but is it just down to the metal that they're made of? Well I believe it is. I know McKinley have problems with uh, their Helgen Loco wheels and they switched out all of their brass wheels for steel um, but if you've had the same problem then please leave a comment in the comment section down below. But there we go not a appalling um, what do you call it couplings and you can see the way it droops there and appalling uh, wheels <laughs> apart from that they're brilliant <laughs> so here is the ballast train that I've made up and as you can see it's a class 22 with a 9z head code which is quite suitable and then we have a crew wagon and followed by 10 dogfish hoppers and right at the back end we have a shark. Now if you haven't come across a shark in the past then this is what it looks like and it appears to have snow plows which are actually ballast plows which are fitted on both ends and it's an integral part of the ballast train. Now here are a couple of questions that you may be able to help me with with my dilemma. As you can see these two dogfish have their discharge wheels on what we would say the right hand side let's say but should they all be configured the same way or like this one where the wheels are together so a guy could hop from one wagon to another but that would result in say the next two wagons having no discharge wheels is there is there a trend? Is this the right way of doing it or are they all pointing the same way? I'm perfectly, I actually haven't got a clue. The other thing is the general look of the train. Having done some research on the internet, often you see amongst the dogfish hoppers, other types of hoppers. There might be a pair of larger hoppers halfway along. And if you have any information on the type of hopper that I need to buy to make this a more realistic train, then please let me know. And there's the crew wagon at the other end which makes perfect sense because this must be a quite a labour intensive job and they're going to want their cup of tea and breakfast and lunch or whatever as these ballast trains make their way slowly around the country back in the late 60s stroke early 70s. It's actually a nice looking train I do like it but the wagons with their wheels are appalling and clearly I need some advice on the coupling so please feel free to let me know. So does any of this really matter that your locos might have the wrong head code or your guards van might have the wrong tail lamps or indeed the whole train might be configured wrong? It doesn't really matter after all we're just playing trains but it does matter to me to be perfectly honest and when I spotted the Hornby magazine here with a Fossil Yeoman mineral wagon being pulled by a Western displaying a Bristol based express passenger head code. I was disappointed to say the least. I did tell you I was sad. Okay, thanks a lot for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to be a patron and help with the channel, there's the button. If you haven't subscribed, there's the button for that. And remember, subscription is free and a video here and here. See you in two weeks' time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye bye.